Dominic Wild won the lottery for the last TQC talk, and he's going to tell us about classical simulation of short time quantum dynamics. Please go ahead. Thank you, Richard, and thanks for sticking around till the end. Um, so, um, I also wanted to very briefly use this opportunity to thank the organizers for putting together this great conference in this lovely location. But since I'm the only thing between you and the beach, I, I want to jump right in. So, I'll talk to you about classical simulation of, of short time quantum dynamics. This was a joint project um, that I did at MPQ together with Alvaro, who's now in Madrid. Um, so, yeah, let's get going. So, I want to sort of motivate this from yeah, it's a similar motivation to what we just had, um, but you know, I think um, you know, we're at this point right now where we can, um, where, where you know, quantum circuits really have started to become interesting. Um, we have 100 qubits or so, and we have pretty decent gate fidelities, and there are many complexity theoretical results, I would say. Um, so we have some idea of when these things are hard, when these things are easy, um, but you know, I'm, I'm sort of a, um, physicist by training, so I also like to think about the, the you know, physical systems that underlie these circuits. Um, and there, you know, there's also been tremendous progress. So, you know, thinking not in the abstraction of circuits, there are now systems with, let's say, hundreds of thousands of atoms. This could also, doesn't have to be atoms, could be other systems too, um, that, you know, hop around in some lattices and interact, and, and they do this with some coherence times that are much greater than the interaction time. Um, you know, it's a much more physical way of thinking about it, but what it tells you is that um, that we expect these systems also to to build up quantum correlations and that they might be difficult to to classically simulate in some regimes. Um, but I think there are you know, much fewer rigorous results on this side um, for many reasons. I think you know, these, these systems are sometimes more difficult um, to treat with our methods and sometimes it's just that the communities are a bit separate, right? So the, the left side certainly appeals a bit more to the computer science community than the right side. Um, so this is what we want to address a little bit, um, or what we try to address a bit in this project, is we'll come up with some understanding when is it hard to simulate something like this, or when is it easy. Um, so, you know, just to be a bit more uh, concrete, um, this is the setup that we had in mind. So we, we initialized the system in some product state, um, and then evolve it under some local Hamiltonian um, H for some time T. Um, and at the end, we measure something. So measuring can be either we measure some local operator, so this is just, it could be a single site operator, it could also be um, something non-local like this, this overlap here with, with the initial state. This, I'll, I'll call this quantity the little Schmidt echo. So this is something that's been studied a lot in physics, um, but it clearly does not have this simple interpretation of a local operator. Um, and, you know, what you naively expect is that at short times, we expect this problem to kind of be easy because we start in a product state, the quantum correlations take some time to build up, and at long times, this problem is probably hard. Um, and in between, we don't really know, and we also don't know where this transition really happens. Um, so let me just show you the results right away. So um, what we looked at is we tried to approximate these things classically, to, uh, to, to some additive error epsilon that scales uh, with the system size as one over a polynomial. Um, so, you know, at the end, we just have one parameter. We ask how does everything scale with the system size? And what we find is that for any constant time, um, you, can, you can come up with a classical algorithm that does this in, in polynomial time. And then at the other end of, so at long times, times that are uh, polynomial in system size, it is also known that this problem is BQP complete. Um, so we don't expect there to be an efficient classical algorithm. And there's some gap of you know, times being poly log n where we currently don't know. So our algorithm does not extend to these times efficiently, and we currently don't know what's, what's happening there. Um, and then for the Loschmidt echo, um, the situation is a little different. So what we actually look at, uh, so explain later, we look at the logarithm of this quantity. Um, we find again at, at short times it's polynomial, but now this is only up to some constant time, which I call T star. So some, some constant depends on, you know, how connected your Hamiltonian is. Um, you know, we have some bounds for it, but it's just some constant. Um, and then it's also known that for some longer constant times, this problem already becomes sharply hard, even for a classical Hamiltonian. Um, and so the intuitive reason is, you know, these, these kind of expectation values, they very quickly become exponentially small, you're trying to approximate the logarithm 
with some additive error. So you're trying to approximate the quantity itself with multiplicative error. You have something exponentially small. You want really high accuracy. It's just difficult. Um, so yeah, this is, this is basically the, the overall summary of, of what we did. So our algorithm applies to in this regime. And then um, there's very small gaps here. Like you know, the, this, this is probably the biggest gap. There's some small gap of constant size here where we don't know what happens. But I think it sort of paints a nice, nice picture. Um, and so our algorithm, this is what I'll talk about for the, you know, for the remaining 15 or so minutes, um, is, is based on what's called a cluster expansion. And in some ways, this is just a Taylor series expansion where you, where you group terms in a way to, to take advantage of the locality that's present in the system. Okay, so I, I mentioned locality a few times. Let me be a bit more precise what I mean by this. Um, so uh, we have a local Hamiltonian, which means it's just a sum of, of local terms. So each of these hx is, is an operator that acts on some subsystem of, of on some subsystem x. So we just label it by, by the subsystems that it acts on. Um, and the lambda x are just real coefficients that we bound them by one. But so um, yeah, also that we assume that the norms of these guys are bounded by one. But that's just sort of the usual stuff. Um, then locality now means that um, we assume k locality. So each of these terms only operates on, on a subsystem of size at most k. Um, and we have to make some sort of assumption about, um, well, something like geometric locality, but we actually assume something a little weaker. And um, I call this low density condition. Um, sometimes people, people talk about sparsity or sparseness. Um, um, but what, it's, what it means in our case is that for each term in the Hamiltonian, we assume that only sort of overlaps with a constant number of other terms in the Hamiltonian. So geometric locality implies this, but it's a little more general than that, actually. So we, um, we can say something about kind of geometric and non-local um, systems, but yeah, this is, this is just a technical assumption. Okay, um, so now what is a cluster? A cluster is just a multi-set of subsystems that appear in the Hamiltonian, right? So all of these are, are um, k-local, so we don't you know, include the, the very large subsystems. Um, and then a multiset is just a set with, with repetition. So we keep track of mu multiplicity, ordering still doesn't matter. And um, I just want to define here also the size of a cluster. It's just the cardinality of this multiset, meaning we count how many uh, subsystems appear, um, uh, including the multiplicity. So you know, for this example here, this has size six. Um, and then another notion that's, I think, very natural is uh, we want to distinguish between connected and disconnected clusters. So a connected cluster is one that cannot be um, decomposed into disjoint clusters. And I think you know, it's very intuitive if you look at these two pictures. This is a um, disconnected cluster and this is a connected cluster. So yeah, I don't think I have to say much more than that. Um, and you really, like, what makes these cluster expansions work is that the number of connected clusters doesn't grow too fast with the size of the cluster. So um, if, if you ask how many clusters are there that of, are up to a certain size or of some certain size um, that are also, let's say, connected to a single site, um, then this only grows exponentially with, with the size of the cluster. Um, and you know, if, if you did something, it's not too hard to see, but if you did something very naive, you might think this is actually some factorial, which then none of these expansions would work. But um, if you're a little bit more careful, then you'll, you'll very quickly see that this, this grows just exponentially with the system size. Um, just because I think some people are more familiar with this, with this language of lattice animals, this is sort of the same story, that you know, the number of lattice animals of a certain size is just exponential in the size. Okay. So then I think I've defined everything that I need um, to tell you what a cluster expansion is. So uh, the essence here is we have these parameters lambda and Hamiltonian, they're just real numbers. Um, and we can think of everything as a function of these parameters lambda. So yeah, our local observable is a function of, of lambda and our Loschmidt echo is also some function of these lambdas. And so what we do is we write down a multivariate Taylor series expansion um, in, these, in these coefficients. Um, and we sort of group them in this way where we sum over the cluster. So each, the, the cluster now tells us which coefficients we're differentiating with respect to and how many times. So these mu's here are just the multiplicities in the cluster. So they just tell me how many times I differentiate. And then there's some combinatorial factor that just comes from the, um, from the cluster expansion. So this is just a product of these new factorials. Um, 
and we take these derivatives and then we expand around lambda equals zero. So that's the cluster expansion. Um, and um, I you know, want to point out also that this, these are not new ideas. These cluster expansions have been used both sort of for rigorous numerical heuristic techniques for a very long time. I think so the rigorous results, you know, uh, one of the earlier you know, big rigorous results is this paper here um, from the 80s. Um, uh, but I think this, this is, it's well known in mathematical physics lecture, uh, in mathematical physics literature, but to us this was kind of new and we actually sort of came across these techniques in, in these two papers here. Um, where they kind of rediscovered this. I think, I'm not sure they were fully aware of these previous results and they use also a very different language. So I think this, this old paper is, is kind of hard to understand. So I think we also try to, to um, take these techniques and translate them into the language of, of uh, modern quantum information. Um, okay. Um, yes. So, okay, now, now that I've defined the cluster expansion, I can tell you a bit about how, how we use it for, um, for algorithms. And there's sort of two steps. First, we want to show that the cluster expansion converges, and then we want to show that, um, that we can also compute the truncated cluster expansion, which then gives us the, um, the approximation. Um, so the first step is to show that only connected clusters contribute in our cluster expansion. Uh, it's very easy to show for, for the local observables, and I'll actually show it to you in the next slide. Um, it's also not too hard to see for, for the Loschmidt echo here. And so what this does, it just bounds the number of terms that we have in the cluster expansion at a given order. Um, and then the second step is to bound the magnitude of each term in the series. Um, and that's again for the local observables, not too hard to do. Um, for the Loschmidt echo, it's a lot of work, um, but it can be done. And, and what, this, what this leads to then is that we establish a convergence of the cluster expansion up to some constant time, T star, which you know, it does depend on, on which of these things we're looking at. It also depends on, um, on, on properties of the Hamiltonian, how connected it is, you know, how k-local it is, all these things, but it's just some constant. And then finally, we have to show that we can compute all of these terms in the series in some time that scales exponentially with the order, and that then all these three ingredients together give us a classical approximation algorithm as a runtime in as polynomial in both 1 over epsilon and polynomial in the system size. Or for the local observables, it's independent of the system size because you know, we only have to consider the region around the, the observable. Okay, so I want to just sort of illustrate these a bit, make it a bit more concrete by talking about the local observables. I should say for these local observables, we can really do things a bit more straightforwardly. We don't need this whole machinery, but for the Lushmaker, the machinery is, is, is very useful. Um, so what we do here is we just now do, instead of doing the Taylor, complicated Taylor expansion in the lambdas, we just do a Taylor expansion in, in, in the t's, and so we get this nested commutators with like m h's here. Um, and then you can just plug in the definition of, of the Hamiltonian as a sum of local terms. So you get you know, this sum over m different subsystems here. And you know, what the cluster expansion basically does, it groups all of this into, into sort of a sum over clusters. Um, but for, for us now, this is actually enough um, because we can just look at this nested commutator and we can see that um, only connected things contribute to this, right? And the reason is just in this first commutator, um, you know, this, this term H has to overlap with A, otherwise the commutator is zero. And then the next one has to overlap with this and so on. So if X were, you know, if these X's formed a, a disconnected cluster, at some point the commutator would just vanish because it doesn't overlap with the rest. Um, and then the second step is just to bound this nested commutator. It's also pretty easy, you know, like if you expand it out, there are two to the m terms, and in each term this gives you sort of the norm of h to the power m and, and the norm of a. Um, and then finally, we can also compute these nested commutators in a time that's exponential in m. Um, and that's, that's maybe a little trickier to see because you have to worry about kind of different permutations of the terms which give you a factorial factor, but you can actually get rid of this by some sort of inclusion, exclusion. Uh, tricks and then you can do it in exponential time. So this is more or less you know, the, the sketch of the proof of this algorithm um, for um, the local observables. And what it gives us is, as I said, it gives us convergence up to some constant time T star. Um, and you know, within, within this region now, I think of T now as a complex variable, you know, because the Taylor expansion works for, for complex variables. Um, Within this, this radius now, I have a polynomial time algorithm too. Uh, that's polynomial in one of epsilon. 
to compute um, the local observable to some additive error plus minus epsilon. Um, one thing that's interesting about the local observable is the convergence argument does not depend on the initial state. So I could have started just with the initial state shifted in time, you know, expand around here, and I will get the same convergence result. It's only the computation that, uh, that meets the assumption that we have a product state. So if we don't have a product state, we don't know how to compute these um, nested commutators, these expectation values of nested commutators, but the convergence result does not depend on this. And so what this means is, you know, anywhere along the real axis, I can draw this circle and I know it converges. Um, and so I have an, an analytic strip around the real axis where this function is analytic. And so what this allows us is we can do analytic continuation from you know, where we are able to compute all of the Taylor series coefficients um, to any other time along here. And the result of this analytic continuation, so we just pick a, an actual specific analytic continuation scheme and bound its errors, is that we get some algorithm that's still polynomial in one of epsilon uh, for any constant time t, it just has some horrendous factors. You know, it has this doubly exponential dependence on time. We actually think this is kind of the best you can do in this setting. Um, but you know, for, for any constant time t, this is still a polynomial time algorithm. Um, and I just want to point out here briefly that um, this is a better dependence on the error than you would get from just sort of a naively Robinson bound where you just say, you know, you truncate inside the light cone um, uh, and, and you sort of do exact diagonalization there. In two or more dimensions, that does not give a polynomial time algorithm in one of epsilon, it's super polynomial. So this is, this is really, does something better than just leap Robinson bounds. Okay, and then very briefly, just wanna, so you might ask, you know, how good are these bounds? Is it really, you know, could it be that this function is analytic everywhere and they're actually a very nice result by Bush that shows that if you go along the imaginary axis, this, this thing can become uh, unbounded and non-analytic, and so this is kind of, you know, up to constant factor improvements, probably the best thing you can do. Um, okay, then just a few words about the lohr echo. So, um, we look at the logarithm of the lohr echo because that actually allows us to only include connected clusters. Kind of easy to see, but in the interest of time, I'll just skip it, and I will also skip how we bounded derivative. Um, that is not easy to see, involves a lot of sort of combinatorial properties of graphs. We learned a lot about graph theory in this project. Um, if you're interested, you know, take a look at the paper and there's something really cool called a tut polynomial. You've never heard of it, it's, it's very nice. So um, yeah, but it's just a lot of technical work and this is really where this formali formalism of the cluster expansion um, comes into play. Um, but the result is the same, you know, we, in, in sort of this circle now, we, we have an efficient algorithm that's polynomial one of epsilon, polynomial in time. Um, and in this case, the analytic continuation that I showed before is not possible. And that the reason is, you know, this Lushmiecker can become zero along the real axis, um, in which case the logarithm becomes non-analytic. And similar in the thermodynamic limit, there can be phase transitions along the imaginary time axis. So there can be non-analyticities everywhere. We don't know how to do our analytic continuation. Um, and you know, this is also expected from the complexity theoretical side, this problem becomes sharply hard. Things have to break down. Um, okay, with this um, already at the end, so let me just briefly summarize. Here's, here's sort of the summary of our results again. Um, so I think you know, this cluster expansion, we used it for these, for these algorithms, but it's a, it's a, I think, general powerful technique for local Hamiltonians. So in, in the paper, we also used it to prove some concentration bounds. Um, other people have used it to uh, prove things like decay of correlations. It's been applied to Hamiltonian learning. So it's, it's just a very efficient way to take advantage of locality. Um, and I think sort of a natural question you might then ask is, is it possible to generalize some of these techniques to power law interactions? So it's been done to some extent, but I think it's a bit unclear in, in, in this setting of dynamics if these, these ideas work. And I think one thing that, that would be very interesting to see is whether um, we can include noise um, in these calculations. So um, I didn't say this, but we can, we can work with mixed states and we can actually work with, um, with sort of Lindblad's dynamics as well, uh, but it's not very efficient. So you wanna sort of do something that is, um, that is better. And I think the idea is if you have local depolarizing noise, it will suppress the high weight operators and the, the cluster expansion might actually be a good tool to keep track of all of that to maybe give you something more efficient for, for noisy dynamics. Um, and I think with this at the end, I'm um, at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions.
Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. Are there questions from the audience? Thanks for the interesting talk. So, uh, of course, this was about classical simulation. But I was wondering if your um, your results about sort of this uh, connected clusters, if this could somehow be used to inform or make better like trotterizations for like quantum simulation of things. Um, that's a great question. I've not I've not thought about that. I mean. Yeah, I've, I've not thought about it much. Like uh, in the connection to trotterizations, we do have some results on sort of multiple Hamiltonians after each other. I think that's one thing I can tell you, but I've, I've really not thought about that angle, so um, we should chat a bit. Okay, thanks. Sorry. More questions? Please. Hi, um, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, you were showing before that there is convergence in this disk around the origin, so also for complex uh, time. Does it mean that one can use some of the same techniques for partition functions, for example? Yeah, so this is where they were originally used, these techniques, right? Okay. And so you can use them to compute free energies, or um, you can show that, that there are no phase transitions at high temperature, proof decay of correlations at, at high temperature, all of these sort of ideas. Um, that's, that's historically where they come from, and I think this is one of the new ideas. It's like the structure of, of dynamics is very similar, so we can also use them here. But yes, uh, absolutely, you can use them for that. Thanks. Uh, hi. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, 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 I, want, uh, I want to ask, like, have you considered like, to uh, do the sampling on the computational basis of your state, rather than just the, 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 the fixed basis? Overlap. Yes, that's a that's a great question. I think I don't know how to do it. Is the short answer right? So the the problem is we need. Let's see. Okay. Well, I can. I guess it doesn't really matter. I can stay here. Um, we need we need to uh, look at the logarithm of. We always expanding around. If if we're looking at sort of some survival probability, we have to put the logarithm there because otherwise we're dealing with disconnected clusters as well. And then you have to make sure that your initial time the thing you're looking at isn't zero. So I can, I can do this for the survival probability. I can compute the survival probability, but I can't really compute any of the other probabilities. I can compute some other things that are sort of a couple of spin flips away because I can sort of include them as some local operators here. Um, but I can't compute any of the other probabilities. Um, and I don't know how to, like, okay, computing probabilities is not the same as sampling, but I also don't know how, how to sample. So it's a, it's a great question. We thought there about it, but we, I can't give you an answer, but it's, I don't know how to do it. I want to ask another question, like, uh, will it make a big difference if we're considering time-independent Hamiltonian rather than time-independent okay. one? Yeah. I, I should actually add, I think there were some recent results that did something in the direction of sampling for sort of short time evolutions. I'm not, I'm not super familiar with what those results were. I think there are some sort of tricks um, where I, you probably have to use the fact that your, your state can't change very much in short times, and then you, you can sort of keep track of it. But I, I yeah. yeah, I've only seen it mentioned. Um, but to your second question, time-dependent Hamiltonian. So what, we've done, what we have looked at is, so a piecewise constant evolution, kind of like a trotter evolution. This you can, you can do, um, and the, what happens is just the, this, this constant up to which you can go. Um, now you have to make sure the sum of all the times is less than this constant, but you actually get another sort of hit. It's not just less than that constant, but sort of divided by the number of times. That's just sort of what our bounds get. So you can do it, but it's not very efficient, is I think the, the answer. Hi. Uh, so you, you kind of phrased your results in terms of this very natural locality um, argument. But it looked from your, your sketch of the proof like what you really needed was commutation. And like the thing that mattered was whether the individual terms commute. So does it generalize neatly or is there some kind of blockage there? 
Sorry, what was the last part? Does it generalize kind of nicely if you assume, you know, you, you take your locality graph and you change it to just like a, a commutation, a graph that encodes the commutation relations, basically, like where the different terms commute? Or yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I So I like the, the technical setting, we basically, you know, we, we think of these interaction graphs where every every mm -hmm. term in the Hamiltonian is a vertex and then you, we connect the terms that, that overlap um, and then, um, and then, the assumption is that that graph is, has bounded degree. Okay. Um, now, you could, so I think if I understand you correctly, like we're not making any assumption what, what the terms are in the Hamiltonian, so what their commutation relations are. But you could, if you know that some of the commutators are zero, and you know something about sort of the whole algebra uh, that can be generated, you could probably build that in somehow. But we, we've not made any, we didn't want to make any assumption about the, the, at some additional structure in the Hamiltonian. But I think it, it is possible that if, if you have some, some additional structure and, and, and all the commutation relations are simple, then, then this could simplify that. Thanks. More questions? Okay, Dominic, I think it seems you made everybody happy. Thank you very, very much.